All engine running. <laughs> Absolute genius. Get this. Welcome. Welcome. <laughs> this is the show where we bring you science. Going. What that essentially means is discovery, is advances, the questions, research, technology. Unbelievable. Without further ado, this is the Naked Scientist. Hello, welcome to this week's Naked Scientists. This is the programme where we bring you the latest breakthroughs in science, technology and medicine with me, Chris Smith. And today, AI, artificial intelligence, is going under our microscope. Do we really understand what it would mean to have new actors, new agents, new entities, new species among us? And have we thought carefully about how we make sure that they play well with us? So are those risks real, or is this AI bubble about to burst? From Cambridge University's Institute of Continuing Education, this is The Naked Scientists. The UK Prime Minister, Rishi Sunak, recently laid out what he thinks is at stake ahead of the country's general election. International conflict and migration were always likely to feature. But perhaps more surprisingly, he also went in hard on generational conflict and developments in artificial intelligence. Now, doomsday warnings that AI can spread falsehood, steal jobs and even bring about the end of humanity are, of course, nothing new. But are these concerns getting over-egged? And might the AI bubble we've witnessed in the last few years be about to implode in a replay of the dot-bomb collapse from two decades back? Well, in a bit to answer that, and also to explore where AI might go next, it's probably best to start with an explanation of how artificial intelligence actually works. And there's no one better to do that than the man dubbed the godfather of AI, and that's Geoffrey Hinton. He began by telling me about the development of AI back in the 70s. So at the time, the idea of doing science by simulating things on computers was fairly new, and it seemed just like the right approach to trying to understand how the brain learns, or at least a complementary approach to doing experiments on the brain. So I spent my time, when I was a graduate student in Edinburgh, writing computer programs that pretended to be networks of brain cells and trying to answer the question, how should the connections between brain cells change so that a collection of brain cells hooked up in a network can learn to do complicated things, like, for example, recognize an object in an image, or recognize a word in speech, or understand a natural language sentence. Do we have a clear idea even today of how that works? Because obviously you were working towards something we had no idea about and trying to model it. Have we got there, or are we still in the dark? Neither of those. We haven't fully got there, but we have a much better understanding. So we now have computer models of neural networks, things that run on a computer but pretend they're networks of brain cells, that work really well. You see that in these large language models and in the fact that your cell phone can recognise objects now. It can also recognise speech. So we understand how to make things like that work and we understand that the brain's quite like many of those things. We're not quite sure exactly how the brain learns but we have a much better idea of what it is that it learns. It learns to behave like one of these big neural networks. If it's down to the fact that we've got brain cells talking to brain cells and they're just big populations of connections, is that not relatively easy to model? What's the hold-up? Why is it hard to do this? Well, the tricky thing is coming up with the rule about how the strength of a connection should change as a result of the experience the network gets. So, for example, very early on in the 1940s or maybe early 1950s, a psychologist called Hebb had the idea that if two neurons, two brain cells, fire at the same time, then the connection between them will get stronger. If you try and simulate that on a computer, you discover that all the connections get much too strong and the whole thing blows up. You have to have some way of making them weaker too. I love that line what fires together wires together it's never left me because I remember reading Hebb's book when I was at University College London so how did you try and address that then was it sort of just a damping problem you make it so that the nerve cells get bored more easily as it were so that doesn't overheat in the way that the computer would otherwise have them do well that's kind of the first thing you think of when you try that and it still doesn't work very well 
So the problem is, can you get it to work well enough so that it can do complicated things, like recognize an object in an image, or in the old days, recognize something like a handwritten digit? So you take lots of examples of twos and threes and so on, and you see if you can make it recognize which is a two and which is a three. And it turns out that's quite tricky. And you try various different learning rules to discover which ones work. And then you learn a lot more about what works and what doesn't work. What doesn't doesn't work and why? OK, I'll tell you something that does work, because that's obviously more interesting. You have a layer of neurons that pretend to be the pixels. So an image consists of a whole bunch of pixels, and the pixels have different brightnesses. And that's what an image is. It's just numbers that say how bright each pixel is. And so that's the input neurons. They're telling you the brightness of pixels. And then you have output neurons. If you're recognizing digits, you might have 10 output neurons, and they're telling you which digit it is. And typically, the network, at least to begin with, wouldn't be sure. So it'd hedge its bets, and it'd say, it's probably a 2, it might just be a 3, it's certainly not a 4. And it would represent that by the output unit for a 2 would be fairly active. The output unit for a 3 would be a little bit active, and the output unit for a 4 would be completely silent. And now the question is, how do you get those pixels as inputs to cause those activities in the outputs? And here's a way to do it that all the big neural networks now use. So this is the same algorithm as is used to train big chatbots like GPT-4. It's used to train the things that recognize objects and images. And it's called backpropagation. And it works like this. You have some layers of neurons between the inputs and the outputs. So the neurons that represent the pixel intensities have connections to the first hidden layer, and then the second hidden layer, and then the third hidden layer, and finally to the outputs. So they're called hidden layers, because you don't know to begin with what they should be doing. And you start off with just random connections in these networks. So the network obviously doesn't do anything sensible. And when you put in an image of a digit, it will typically hedge its bets across all the possible 10 digits and say they're all more or less equally likely because it hasn't got a clue what's going on. And then you ask the following question. How could I change one of the strengths of the connections between a neuron in one layer and a neuron in another layer so that it gets a little bit better at getting the right answer? So suppose you're just trying to tell the difference between twos and threes. To begin with, you give it a two and it says, with a probability 0.5, it's a 2. With a probability 0.5, it's a 3. It's hedging its bets. And you ask, well, how could I change connection strength so that it would say 51% 2 and 49% 3? And you can imagine doing that by just tinkering with the connections. You could choose one of the connection strengths in the network, and you can make it a little bit stronger and see if that makes the network work better or work worse. If it makes it work worse, obviously you make that connection a little bit weaker. And that's sort of a bit like evolution. And you could do that. And it's obvious that in the end that will work, but it would take huge amounts of time. So in the early days, we would use networks that had thousands of connections. Now these big chatbots have trillions of connections. And it would just take forever to train it that way. But you can achieve pretty much the same thing by this algorithm called backpropagation. So what you do is you put in an image, let's say it's a two, the weights are initially random, weights on the connections. So information will flow forward through the network, and it'll say 50% is a 2 and 50% is a 3. And now you send a message back through the network. And the message you send back is really saying, I'd like you to make it more likely to be a 2 and less likely to be a 3. And if you send the message back in the right way, you can figure out for all the connections at the same time how to change them a little bit so the answer is a little bit more correct. That's called backpropagation. It uses calculus, but it's essentially doing this tinkering with connection strengths that evolution would do by just changing one at a time, but the backpropagation algorithm can figure out for all of them at the same time how to change each one a tiny bit to make things work better. And so if you have a trillion connections, that's a trillion times more efficient than just changing one and seeing what happens. Geoffrey Hinton, and you'll get to hear the whole story from him in our forthcoming Titans of Science series, which returns at the end of June. So now we have a better understanding of how AI works. It's a long training process of fine-tuning neural networks until we get the outputs we're looking for. 
And it can lead to extremely exciting technologies, not least the language models that have sent big tech companies scrambling to integrate AI systems into their products. But there are other, and for the moment at least, more tangible real-world examples of how it might actually be improving our lives. And I've been speaking with the tech journalist David McClelland to hear more. Artificial intelligence, it isn't really a new technology or concept. You can go back centuries and if people first started talking about AI. You look at the birth of modern AI back in the 1940s, 1950s, during, for example. But over the last... 18 or 24 months or so, I'd say. I think we've been riding what some would call an innovation wave or others might call it a hype cycle that's been powered by a subset of AI known as generative AI. Very crudely, generative AI is a type of AI that can create new synthetic content, words, pictures, video, based upon what it's been trained on. So, for example, I might have a tool like ChatGPT summarize the plot of Les Miserables the musical in the style of a Shakespearean sonnet. And because that's been trained on, it's ingested the entire works of Shakespeare and it's got various synopses of West End musicals, it'll very quickly come back to me with a tight 14 lines on Les Mis. But the thing to remember about these AI systems, they aren't really knowledge-based, they are statistical. So ChatGPT has got no concept of what a sonnet or a West End musical actually is. It is essentially just guessing what word is most likely to come next in a sentence based upon what it's come across before. And the same is true for these generative AI systems that can create amazing photorealistically, photorealistic images and even videos. These outputs can look incredibly real. But they're also prone to some basic errors, um, like misrepresenting human hands with too many or too few fingers, because, again, it doesn't actually understand what a hand is. So my take on the overall AI narrative at the moment, generative AI, is that we're still at this party tricks phase. There's a lot of wow moments that look great in presentations and can impress friends, indeed scare people as well. But examples of where generative AI is really adding and creating real value at scale to humanity are are somewhat slower to emerge, but I think we are starting to see them now. Yeah, indeed. Um, We are seeing some examples in the medical space, for example, aren't we? We we have seen people using this in radiotherapy for cancer treatment, in imaging, because AI can be taught to be better than we are at spotting certain diagnoses. It's that, that kind of thing. It does appear to be getting some traction. Yeah, and there's a, there's a couple of areas, both, like you say, in uh, in medical imaging, using more traditional machine learning models where these systems can update their knowledge based upon what they're seeing to identify cancer from scans. Studies have shown that they can perform at least on par with medical experts faster than humans, which is really important when skilled resources around the world might be at a premium and waiting lists in in certain nations are starting to grow as well. Some recent research has found that AI plus human review of breast cancer screenings, this was a study in Sweden, it can increase the detection rate beyond just humans alone, even two humans looking at it. And there was an NHS trial in Scotland earlier this year of a tool called uh, MIA, which was able to identify early stage cancers that doctors had failed to identify themselves. And that kind of benefit means much less invasive procedures for a uh, a, a cancer patient later on down the line, a much higher survival rate. But also with generative AI as well. One area of generative AI which really does seem to be showing some promise is chatbots. Now, chatbots have had a bit of a bad rap over the years, Um, you know, whether they're used for customer services, for example, and they don't quite understand you. The more modern chatbots that use generative AI capabilities are really showing some potential. So academics at the University of Cambridge have been researching the use of ChatGPT chatbots to triage people with potential eye or eyesight problems as a way of deciding which patients need urgently to be seen by specialists. And one of the most recent versions of the ChatGPT model, GPT-4, it was found to perform better 
than junior doctors, and it's not expected to replace eye doctors, but these tools can support GPs and other non-specialist medical practitioners in helping speed patient care, save people's eyes. And again, maybe that's something that in, in some countries we take for granted, the availability of medical staff. But as you start looking elsewhere around the world, even having somebody who can just answer basic questions and steer you to the right course of, uh, of medical help can be invaluable. It's a bit like the sort of E equivalent of an exoskeleton suit that you know you hear people on production lines having these extra suits they can strap mm. on to give them more strength to do bigger jobs because computer coders are also saying that it's taking some of the grunt out of relentlessly recoding or coding up bits of work that people have already solved that problem but instead of having to go and find that solution string it together in the right way you just tell a gpt type system go and get this and assemble me some code to do the following job and it does it Developers are finding generative AI and have done for, for a few years now incredibly useful. And given that the semantics of computer code are fairly rigid, very, very rigid, in fact, it actually plays very much into uh, large language models and generative AI systems' hands. It's the same as with some areas of creative work as well. It's that problem of having the blank piece of paper. How do you get started with a particular problem? What does the basic research look like? And whether you're a journalist or whether you are a software developer, being able to type a, a prompt, and this is what you know we're used to typing into a search engine, a search query. When you are conversing with a generative AI system, we, we type in what's known as a prompt. Create something for me that does this, and it sounds like that, for example. When one is creating those prompts, you can get something back that might get you 70, 80, maybe 90 percent of the way there. It might not get you all of the way there, but you then as the as the journalist, you become an editor and you are editing some work and making sure that it is factually accurate, that it, it tells the story that you want to create. And the same with a software developer as well. Does it solve the problem? Are there any gaps in the code? Is there anything that you might need to tweak? You can save so much time doing some of the basic work and it enables you to operate potentially at a, at a much higher level. Some people would, might be concerned that AIs will come for their jobs. And there is a, a saying that it's not that you'll be replaced by an AI. It's that you may be replaced by a person who knows how to use an AI. And what I've been trying to do in my work is to find ways where I can use an AI to help me with some of my more menial tasks. And more often than not, I'm finding it to be very helpful. Does it write better than you can? No comment. Tech journalist David McClelland there. And it was interesting that while we were researching this topic, we actually started to get lots of product promotions and journal articles all about AI. It's almost as though artificial intelligence was offering its services to the naked scientists. Very 1984. Now, as we were just hearing from David, in some areas, AI has come on leaps and bounds. And it's also raised another question. Can it think and act like we do? Last summer... Google fired an engineer who claimed that one of the company's AI systems had become sentient, and the human-like qualities of AI have indeed sparked debate between groups as diverse as computer scientists, philosophers, cognitive scientists, and even Buddhist monks. Nikki Clayton told me about a recent summit she'd just attended debating this very topic in Nepal. Well, I was in Kathmandu at a wonderful conference on how to study and understand non-human consciousness. And by non-human, they meant both animals and artificial intelligence. And who was at the conference? Well, the usual suspects, neuroscientists and philosophers and psychologists, as you would expect, and computer scientists, but with an interesting and important twist. A lot of Buddhist monks. Why were they there? Apart from the fact it's Nepal, which is next door to where they're from. I suppose it was to explore big picture questions about consciousness. For Buddhists, assume that all animals, not just humans, are conscious. And they find it very hard to imagine that a machine might have consciousness. And I agree, it's one thing to say that a machine can do all kinds of amazing things that it's programmed to do and outsmart people at 
the game of chess, for example, but that they could actually reflect on their thoughts, reminisce about the past, imagine the future and strategize when is option one better than option 37. I find that hard to imagine, so I guess I'm on the side of the Buddhist monks on this one. Did the computer scientists disagree with you then? Did they Do they think their machines are alive or... Was everyone of like mind? Not everyone was of like mind, but many of the computer scientists also agree that machines can do a lot because of how they're pre-programmed. And these language models are very persuasive about some of the things that the machines can learn so quickly. But most people, I think, were not convinced that machines have consciousness. Nikki Clayton on whether AI is alive or not. You're listening to The Naked Scientist with me, Chris Smith. Still to come, what should governments be doing to prepare their populations for the arrival of AI? Before that, though, will more data and more sophisticated models mean generative AI of the type that we've been discussing continue to improve or will we begin to see diminishing returns from this burgeoning field? Mike Pound is a computer scientist at the University of Nottingham. I think it is getting more powerful. Continued development in the research community means that some of these methods are now much more performant than they were before. They produce really, really impressive output. But I also think that the way we use these tools has become easier. So chatbots, there are websites where you can go and talk to them, and that gives people the impression that AI is on the rise even though it's sort of been happening behind the scenes for quite a few years. So in your view then, is it going to continue on the present trajectory? Or is it going to be a bit like where we said with Moore's law, with the power of computer chips and processors, that we are going to reach a point where they're not going to be able to get any better because something begins to hold things back? It's something that not every academic agrees. I think that there is a tendency to assume that because of this rapid rise of, let's say, chatbots, that they're going to only get better and better from now on. I think that the view that many people subscribe to, and in fact, the thing I sort of subscribe to at the moment, is we haven't really seen evidence yet that they will continue to get better at quite this rate. You know, we've seen new chatbots emerge, but since then we've seen iterations of these chatbots that don't double the power, they don't triple the power, they just get a bit better each time. And so I think for a while, unless something drastic changes, we might expect to see iterations and evolutions of these things rather than something that comes along and just blows everything out of the water again and presses us with a whole new set of abilities. Uh, and when one considers these these engines, are they really generalists? As in, as they get more powerful, are they just going to get better and better at doing everything? Like a Swiss army knife does a range of different jobs and it does them well. Or are they very, very specific and they're very good at doing one thing really, really well? And there's a few spin-offs that it does half-heartedly and we're fooled into thinking it's doing a good job. Mm. This is the really interesting question is to what extent can we make AI a general purpose tool? And to what extent do we have to have a specific AI for a specific role? And I think at the moment, the very best models are the ones that are specific to a task. So in my research, I often have a very specific thing that I'm trying to do. So for example, I'm trying to diagnose something in a medical image, or I'm trying to identify something in a plant image. And in those times, a very specific AI aimed at that task is the thing that will get the best results. When I train an AI, if I'm doing a really good job and I want to train it to recognise cancerous moles, I train it to recognise a mole, then I train it to recognise cancerous moles from healthy moles but it's focusing on moles i'm not distracting it with pictures of mathematical formulae or daisies and tomatoes yes that's exactly right if you ask a chatbot to diagnose a cancerous mole it will say something but that thing is unlikely to be correct because we've never actually explained that problem or explained the the biology behind these cancerous moles or anything like this i think that in the tech sector, so the big companies that are training these giant models, there is a tendency to believe that if we just double the amount of data or triple the amount of data, we will get better and better models and they'll become so performant that they can do any task and they can do medical imaging, they can do plant imaging, they can analyze our general home photos as well. And actually, that doesn't seem to be the case. If you want the very best performance, it's better to have a smaller data set on a specific problem. So it might be that we do see an uptick in the ability of these models the more data we add but you know the resources that training these is taking 
on the scale of data of the internet is now becoming very, very high. And so there will be a point, I think, where we have to start making decisions as to whether it's efficient or indeed if we can afford to do it. It costs a lot of money to train these models. And if they only get a small performance boost each time you double the size of the data, at some point you're going to decide that's not worth doing. Niels Bohr famously said or is alleged to have said that uh, prediction is very hard, especially when it concerns the future. I'm going to ask you to predict the future. Um, mm. What What's going to be the thing we have to work on or solve then? Um, where, where is the, the next emerging thing with this? What can it do at the moment, but not that well? Or what's, what's the gap we haven't closed? What dots are we mm. going to join next, do you think, to really move this on? Yeah, so I think separately, we're going to see people continue to develop bigger versions of these models, and we will see what happens there. And we're going to see people continue to develop smaller models for specific tasks. And, you know, and that's a separate thing. But I think that the thing we're really missing at the moment, especially with these largest of models, is having them actually interact with us on a day to day basis. And so people often ask me what the difference is between a smartphone assistant like Siri, or a chatbot like ChatGPT. And the answer is actually Siri is much more constrained because it actually has to do real things. So, you know, if you ask Siri to put something in your calendar, it actually has to go and do that. And it has to know how to talk to your calendar app. And if you ask it to go on the web and search for some data, it has to be able to do that. And most chatbots don't need to do this. They can just write text that looks nice, but hasn't actually had to source any data. It's just what's in the training set. And I think actually it becomes quite a lot more difficult when you actually have to control systems based on what the output of your AI is because your risks are much higher. Having a chat with your chatbot, if it gives you a bad poem or it writes a bad paragraph, that's not an absolute problem. But if it's controlling your self-driving car, that becomes a much bigger problem. And so I think that the next few years, we're going to have to really start to work on how we integrate these systems in a safe way with things that we actually are trying to do day to day. And some of us are long enough in the tooth and old enough to remember the dot com that rapidly turned into the dot bomb bubble. Hmm. Do you think we're at that sort of precipice again, that this is all over inflating, over hyping and it's going to implode? Or do you think that actually it's in good shape and here to stay? In, in an annoying way, I actually think it's both things at the same time. I think that there is incredible abilities of AI that we've just seen coming up in the last few years that are going to transform areas like drug discovery and and you know that is going to have a profound impact but i also think that there is a lot of hype with these chatbots and people assuming they're doing something that perhaps they're not and when we actually start trying to use these chatbots to do things we're going to find they need to be much more accurate than they are all the time and that's when it becomes really really difficult there will be a bursting of the bubble in the sense that people will get used to what they can and can't do and they'll use them with that in mind they perhaps might not be quite so hyped as they are today but I do think that they are incredibly useful tools and they are going to become more and more prevalent in our day-to-day lives. Mike Pound from the University of Nottingham. But what if the likes of Microsoft and Google do manage to overcome the technical challenges to improving generative AI even further? We've heard about the varied and impressive use cases for AI across a broad range of fields but these examples all involve complementing the hard work of humans not replacing them. What if this changes in the future? Gillian Hadfield is a law professor and economist at the University of Toronto, and she's just participated in a policy forum on this topic for the journal Science. We don't know if we'll get there, but we need to think about as possible that we could have artificial agents kind of just participating in our world with us, a bit like an alien species. It could be quite wonderful because this could be new members of our society that bring us lots of intelligence and ways of solving big problems. I think when I get worried is when I think about, do we really understand what it would mean to have new actors, new agents, new entities, new species among us? And have we thought carefully about how we make sure that they play well with us. You've got a policy forum that you've just put together in science, one of the world's leading science publications. What were the points that you bring up there and why have you picked on those things? One is to really emphasise how quickly the technology is advancing and the trajectory we might be on to really quite fundamental change 
And my contribution in particular is to draw attention to we really haven't thought about how to adapt all the complex structure that we bring to making sure that our human societies are by and large safe, cooperative, happy places. Of course, there's no sense in which they are completely. A key point of the piece from my perspective is to say, we need to raise the urgency with which we are thinking about how would we in fact integrate, like I said, this alien species into our world. You're alluding to a lack of urgency on something that you think is a high priority. Usually people deprioritize things they don't think are going to happen. So do you think really there's a lot of hope and hype out there, but the people who really know, know different, and that's why they're not really pushing the envelope on this? I don't think that's the case. We have people who are at the heart of the technology who are raising the concern about how rapidly things are going and the potential for it to achieve levels of transformation, to change our world. People disagree without that, but the disagreement is not between the people who know what's happening and the people who don't. I think the lack of urgency is actually coming from the general public as well as our regulators and politicians and governors, et cetera, not really having a good idea of why this would be such a challenge to how we do things. I think we take for granted a lot of the basic invisible ways in which we make sure that people behave themselves. And they're not there for this alien species. They they wouldn't be in place. And so I don't think the lack of urgency is because people who know best know that it's not going to happen. Whose problem do you think it is? Do you think it is the problem of the companies? Because a lot of this technology is in the hands of commercial entities who are profit-making organisations that are multinational. So do you think it's down to them to sort this out? Or do you think it's a policymaker thing? But of course, with that comes differences of geography, culture, etc. I think the fact that this technology is being built almost exclusively inside private technology companies is precisely one of the reasons we who are not inside those technology companies need to be paying a lot of attention. I think we are potentially watching the decision making, the power to decide what will our lives look like shift from, you know, our councils and our towns and our governments and our communities into technology companies. And I think that's a bad thing. So I definitely think that this is a job for for all of us who are not technologists to really understand what's happening and to be paying enough attention to say, hey, wait a second, we should be in charge for how this new world evolves. Is that your wish list then? There needs to be some rules. At the moment, it's it's the Wild West and anyone seems to be able to do anything and that's your concern. We need to be putting in place the mechanisms for us to even understand what's going on. So a proposal that I've made with some colleagues is to say, you know, we need basic visibility for governments into what's being built. We don't have that right now. So we should have national registries that require that the governments have a right to know what's being built what we know about what it can do, what we know about the safety measures. So we should have that in place quite, quite urgently. And I think that we should be recognizing, for example, that the billions of dollars that are being poured into development right now is driving towards creating increasingly autonomous AI agents, agents that can go out and book you airline tickets and make reservations for you, and maybe even start designing products and contracting to have them built and sold, you know, to really start participating in our society and our economy. But we don't have any of the rules around that that we have around ordinary humans being able to participate, like 
work authorization or an address, some way of finding out who somebody is, tracking that down, et cetera. An AI agent should have a legal identity that allows us to say that one is not allowed to operate anymore, or this one has to pay for the damages that were created. And oh, by the way, that means it needs to have assets behind it, a bank account, basically. So I think there's that kind of infrastructure that I think we need to rapidly be putting in place. Gillian Hadfield at the University of Toronto, and you can read the policy forum she and Jeff Hinton have contributed to in science. Meanwhile, the tension that Gillian was referring to between governments and corporations is set to come into focus once more as politicians and AI industry leaders prepare for the second AI safety summit in Seoul in the coming days. We'll be sure to keep you across any major developments here on the programme. That's all, though, for today. Next time, as infected blood victims are finally promised compensation following the UK government's cover-up of the scandal, we trace the story back to the very beginning and hear from some of the victims who now have justice. If you like what we do here at The Naked Scientists, do please consider dropping us a donation via nakedscientist.com forward slash donations. Every little helps. We're extremely grateful for your support and we do depend very heavily on what you can spare to help keep the show on the road. That's nakedscientist.com forward slash donations. The Naked Scientist comes to you from the University of Cambridge's Institute of Continuing Education. It is supported by Rolls-Royce. I'm Chris Smith, and from everyone here on the team, thank you for listening, and until next time, goodbye. <laughs>